Hello, my name is Melissa Jennison and welcome to Discussions in Audio Mastering. attached to a CD or DVD, vinyl record or tape cassette, and ever wondered what does mastering mean? While most of us understand the terms recording and mixing, very few recognise mastering. It is the aim of these discussions to inform and educate those interested in audio about the art of mastering. We were fortunate enough to have discussions with five top Melbourne-based mastering engineers who shed some light and engineering wisdom on this little known and understood audio process. What are your thoughts concerning the so-called loudness wars? Yeah, it's a funny old topic that one, isn't it? Um, well, I think, you know, as I was saying before, you, you, you'd need to, you need to be sort of, um, loud enough um, to compare with other records that are out there because people um, now are listening to things on their iPods, on their computers and they're making their own playlists. Um, there, are, um, there are options in iTunes and other software where you can ask the program to sort of balance those levels up um, but a lot of people don't realise that and, and I'm not really sure that they're a great thing to do anyway. Um, so you know your your tracks need to be competitively loud, uh, otherwise they're just going to sound wimpy compared with other tracks. On the other hand, I don't think there's any need to make it the loudest track in the world. Um, and you know a lot of people say that uh, if if tracks are made really loud um, because they're digitally compressed and so on, then they lose their um, dynamics. They obviously they do lose dynamics, they lose their punchiness, um, and they become tiring to listen to. <clears throat> which I think is a, is definitely an issue. But when I'm mastering, I always compare um, the original mix to the mastered version at the same level, um, so that I'm not fooled by the fact that it's louder. Mm -hmm. So with the equipment I've got, I'm able to to compare, you know, at the same level, and that means that you can, you know, try and retain the original um, punchiness and dynamics as much as possible while still getting it loud. That's what I aim to do. Yeah. Mm. Well, loudness, well, when they talk about wars, it's, it's quite silly. There's no war going on. Um, look, I, I think even from when I started, um, the loudness thing has been here forever. Um, the engineer that could cut the loudest lacquer was the guy that got the biggest gigs because louder is perceivably better. Um, I think it's got to a point where it's gone a little bit silly in terms of how loud CDs have gotten and the lack of, you know, dynamics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but my take on it is this. Um, loud CDs uh, are here to stay. Um, the genie came out of the bottle eons ago. It's become a commercial imperative. I rarely have come across a client that'll say to me, oh, we, we don't care about the loudness. And sometimes when that, that has happened, 
after you know they they're, they're well informed about it and they want yeah we want dynamic integrity blah 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 great that's a very refreshing view and very often uh, after you've gone through the process someone will sit there and say so if we have this in iTunes and we have this up next to Slipknot are we going to be in the same ballpark and these are jazz clients you know what I mean <laughs> so you know I, I think look you're a service industry so you you. If I'm left to my own devices, I'm going to make a CD as loud as I possibly can without it being distorted and without it being too crushed. So um, I think it's here to stay. And if you're a good engineer, you're going to try and do the best you can to make it, still make it sound good and loud at the same time. That's the challenge. So either you, you, you do that and you take it on or you just take your bat and ball and go home and piss and moan about it. So. Oh, look at... I'm over, personally, I'm over the whole loudness wars. I'm not even sure if I need to answer that fully. Everyone seems to say the same thing. It's not required. Uh, it's, it can destroy a mix at times. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, dynamics far better left in a track, and that's what your volume is there for on your stereo. We've all heard those answers before, but the fact is that uh, you know, I'm, I am also running a business. Yeah. I, to me, all I care about is that everyone's happy. And most people out there still are demanding loud CDs. Yeah. And if I can't provide that, then they're going to go somewhere else that will. Yeah. So I don't think it's important or necessary, but if I want to keep paying the rent... I'm going to do the things that uh, are asked of me and uh, regardless of what purists, engineers, audiophiles or anyone else thinks, at the end of the day, if a record label asks me to make uh, a CD loud then, and they're going to pay me to do that, then I'm going to do that. Yeah. You know? So yeah. my personal opinion then becomes uh, pointless. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In truth, people were of the impression that Loudness sells in advertising. That's why every time a commercial comes on the TV, you've got to turn your TV down. Mm. Okay, and they and with this digital technology, it's easy to make a record loud. It's not necessary to make records loud because if you if you listen to a record that has been over processed by inappropriate processing, excuse me, in attempt attempts to make it loud, what happens, it, it can be incredibly exhausting to listen to the music, you know. Some of the records that I listen to, if I look at them on a spectrum analyzer, and I've got a spectrum analyzer in there that shows me the left right waveform, you look at that analyzer and it's got what I'm going to call the hedge effect. It's just whack. You know, there is no, re you can't see the kick, the snare, the kick, the snare, the kick, the snare. Yet, the record sounds great. So, depending on who's done that record, there can be what I'll call a micro, inverted commas, micro dynamic here, whereby the record still moves dynamically and sounds sensational, even though it's been uh, compressed and or limited to within an inch of its life. And there's nothing worse than having clients who come back and go, oh, it's not loud enough. Just after you've sat there, as you've sat and tried to say, point out to them, look, this is what's going to happen if you make it loud enough, uh, if you make it too loud. You know, I try and give people the analogy, in the carousel, the CD carousel, when we've got 10 records, we want your record to sit somewhere in the middle ground. Mm -hmm. Not 10 records of all different kinds, but 10 records of a similar genre. Yours has got a, if yours is the loudest record, well, maybe I've overprocessed it. But if it's the softest record, maybe I've underprocessed it. If we're somewhere in the middle, then I'll be happy and so should you. Do many artists ask you to work with stems? Yeah, it's getting quite, uh, quite common these days. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's because uh, a lot of stuff's being mixed in project studios and home studios. So um, those, those guys may be a little unsure of the how the mix is sounding maybe they've got you know they're not sure what the bottom end is really like because their studio's got a few anomalies there uh, or they're not experienced um, in mixing so mixing in stems and giving it to the mastering engineer means that um, I have a bit of leeway there so you know if there's 
if the vocal is sibilant, for instance, um, I can de-s the vocal separately without affecting the rest of the tracks. Um, uh, or if there's you know too much bass, I can pull the bass down. So often we'll get you know five stems uh, as a minimum, say bass, drums, um, guitars, keyboards, and vocals, typically, and they're all stereo stems with all their effects as they would be in the mix. So when they run off the stems, they just drop out um, everything else and they don't change any levels so that when I put it all together um, at zero dB, that'll sound exactly like the mix that they, they finished with. Yeah. But it also allows me to um, send the stems out of, out of Pro Tools, which is the program I'm playing my files from, into um, a summing amplifier, an analog summing amplifier. And that's a nicer way of summing the stems than it would be in the digital bus of Pro Tools, particularly because um, people don't tend to watch the levels in the mix bus when they're mixing. So quite often the mix bus will be soft clipping the peaks of the, of the files um, without letting them know because Pro Tools does that in such a way that it doesn't digitally distort, but it does affect the sound. Yes. So if you can stem those out into the analog world, um, <clears throat> they will sound better. Not really, no. Uh, and we don't really encourage it either. Mm. They can open up a hole in your can of worms. Mm. Um, really, you, if they can get the mix sounding as good as they can, we'll certainly take it to the next level. If we're starting to mess with the mix, then uh, that often can be no end to the the, um, the changes required, you know. Mm. But people that have no lack of confidence in their mixing or beginners, that they do ask, and of course we can do that, you know. Uh, yeah. We'll just try not to uh, drag it on it all week long. But yeah. Yeah, it's, it is rare though, it's rare. Okay, that's yeah. interesting. Occasionally it does get called uh, in. Um, my philosophy on that is my preference is not to work with stems. The reason I say that is because as a mastering engineer, my job is to work the left and right channel and work with a stereo mix and work with the, the, the vision of the artist. You know, the, When you get into stems, it becomes a, a bit of a minefield because it becomes more of a quasi-mix session. So even if you are working with an, in, um, an instrumental and a vocal track, it's still... It becomes then your responsibility as a master engineer to make those calls, mm -hmm. and I don't think that's really, you know, our job. Our, you know, a mix engineer does the mix, uh, works in conjunction with the artist and the producer to create the final mix, and um, and go from there. I don't really want to have that responsibility. Secondly, it's it's a much more time-consuming exercise as well as um, cost-wise as well. So for most people, just that alone is enough for them, um, enough incentive not not to do it. Uh, the way I get around the whole stems issue with the client is I'd say to them, okay, if there's a particular element of your mix that you're not sure about, you might want to do something like a vocal up or a vocal down or a bass up or a bass down. And that way we've got some options to work with. And you might have a scenario where, for example, um, you can do something creative like um, you might have two versions of a mix and you might say, oh, I like the vocal live in the chorus, but I like the vocal up in the verses. And so you can edit them in and so you can still be a little bit creative mm. and still get the best of both worlds without actually making those decisions in the mix, which, you know, I don't think it's a master engineer's job to do. But I understand why people do it. I understand the flexibility behind it. And for some people that want to go that way, if they insist they want to work that way, after I've explained the rationale behind why I would prefer not to and off them the other option. If they still say, look, they want to do it, they're happy to commit the time, they're happy to commit to the uh, to the money, then fine, no problem at all. Stems is a bit of a buzzword in my mind. If you want to spend lots of extra money with stems, then, then uh, I'm happy to take your money. <laughs> the truth of it is, okay, if you're concerned about the vocalist, do another, the vocal being too soft, do another pass as the mix engineer with the vocal up 2 dB, vocal down 2 dB, that kind of stuff. But you know, the problem is when you get into stems, your one song mastering uh, session can blow out so dramatically financially that it takes forever. Mm -hmm. To do an album takes days. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done it and it's a dumb idea, you mm -hmm. know. 
It's somebody's idea to extract more money from the poor musicians. I don't buy it, to be honest. You know, I'm if you if you're really uncertain about your mixes, don't bring them in. Don't bring them in. Go and go and go and have a listen. Work a bit harder on them. Mm. But if you bring stems in, it's going to take forever. It will cost you an arm and a leg. Mm. What advice would you give aspiring mastering engineers? Um, if you want to do it, just do it. Don't let anyone hold you back. I think um, if it's something that is your dream, then you should just go for it. And um, it, it's possible. I think a lot of us older guys in particular um, tend to want to hold people back. And, and I think that's more of an insecurity issue. Uh, I think um, competition's a healthy thing. And, um, and you become successful by helping other people become successful anyway. So, um, you know, us older guys, I think we have an obligation to pass on knowledge and to help people out. So, you know, if kids want to do it, I reckon just go for it. Absolutely just go for it. Um, because if you don't, then you'll never, ever, ever find out whether you're going to make it or not. So um, I, I encourage them all to go, have a go and see. I mean, you, you never know where you're going to land anyway. So, yeah, totally. Just, just go for it. I think... Mastering is probably one area of sound engineering where there's probably still some, or more hope of getting a job um, in a professional establishment. So mastering's kind of, um, you know, it's an interesting area to get into. I think it, it you it have to take it takes a certain type of person because it's not exciting work. Like you're not recording a band where they're all in the studio and everyone's vibed and everything. So it's a little bit boring and sort of um, meticulous. I think you've got to be a bit OCD in order to uh, to enjoy it. Um, and you've got to be quite good with people. I think that's one of the most important parts of being a sound engineer full stop is uh, just being able to relate to people and, and understand what they want um, and to be patient. Um, but yeah, I, th I don't think I can think of anything particularly else that they require. Mm. Um, I would say that you know you need to be a really good mi recording and mixing engineer first. I, I, that seems to be the trend at the moment. There seems to be less opportunity in the way that I got into it in the traditional sense of getting some kind of apprenticeship at a studio coming up through the ranks and it's a beautiful system that was great and it's not there anymore which is a real shame you know there's no money in that anymore people can't afford to take on people and pay them a wage and train them for years because it takes years to be a mastering engineer um, and a good one at that um, so now I think the best way is to be a really good recording engineer do lots of recordings and mixes get lots of albums under your belt and then kind of get into into the industry that way um, that seems to be a very logical progression for lots of guys getting into it now they've done 10 15 years of studio recording and now starting to delve into mastering but because they have that reputation to follow them they're finding it quite smooth to get into the mastering game so it's probably the the best way to get into it yeah. work hard work hard um, listen to Listen to what other people have got to say because there's some fantastic people out there that can mentor you. Mm. I had I was lucky enough to have um, John French who worked at TCS uh, and did the Skyhooks records uh, give me some solid feedback when I was working as a musician and a producer and he showed me a lot of stuff that a lot of other people didn't. Okay, be uh, talk to other talk to other engineers. Unfortunately, it's a bit closed shop, and I don't think it should be, you know. I mean, uh, I try and share every technique that I've learned along the way because they're not my techniques. I've just stolen them off somebody, you know. And, you know, I mean, uh, it's important to try and pass them on, you know. Uh, there, there, there are some great engineers out there. You can learn from them. Don't try and make every mistake yourself. Life is too short. We hope you've enjoyed discussions in audio mastering and have a greater understanding of the necessary processes and what is involved for an experienced engineer to attain a professional standard of audio fidelity.
must be something in the music. Come on! Oh, it must be something in the music. Baby. It must be something in the music.